This video is on the barriers to trade and graphing the barriers to trade. There are various types of barriers to trade, which include tariffs, which are simply a tax on imports, a quota, which limits the number of imports that are allowed, a government could decide to subsidize domestic producers to help them be more competitive on the world market, thus lowering the price of doing business of the domestic producer and making it more competitive when you compare them to possibly lower priced items overseas and increased regulation, making it harder for foreign goods to easily access local markets, so creating laws regulating various aspects of the good. We've already talked for reasons on why free trade is good, so the arguments for trade protection would be things like the infant industry argument. So if you can imagine in the United States that a new company is starting up in a new industry that maybe is much more competitive overseas, but America or the country is trying to promote a brand new industry from emerging. So what they're going to do is they're going to protect that infant industry. And to economists, there want to be a time limit on that and say maybe the, for 10 or 15 years, we're going to have high trade protection policies in place for that industry. And with the idea of eventually removing them once that infant industry has grown up and is much more suitable for world competition. It could be a strategic trade policy targeting a specific country's strong market and leveling the playing field for domestic producers. It could be for national security purposes. If you can imagine America produces a lot of stealth technology and a lot of nuclear weapons, or has the capabilities at least to do that. So it, we would not want to trade those kind of, kind of military secrets away. Health, safety, and environmental standards. So obviously if a foreign country is producing pajamas that light on fire, um, that would be bad especially if they were kids' clothing. And so having some health, safety, and environmental standards in place is important uh, based on the moral compass of, of that country. And then efforts of a developing country to diversify. So if we take a nation that focuses mostly on tourism, so maybe someplace with nice sandy beaches, and so the focus of the entire country's economy is on one industry or on, I mean, there's other industries involved, but they're really at main, many of their efforts are towards, let's say, tourism. Then the country can decide to diversify, and so they're going to throw trade protection uh, policies in place for other industries to promote diversification. Because in times, and especially in the Caribbean, there are countries that have been like this where they focus so much on tourism that they don't diversify, and most of their eggs are in that one basket. And when a natural disaster strikes, say a hurricane or tsunami, then their entire economy is devastated because everything is built around one industry. So a country may put up trade protections to allow for basically infant industries to develop and um, the country's economy to diversify. Some economically questionable arguments for trade protection would be things like tariffs as sources of government revenue. The idea is like, why tax U.S. citizens more when we can tax foreigners who can't vote? Um, so many citizens like this idea because it's like, hey, you know, they're taking advantage of our markets, so why not tax them instead of us? Uh, the anti-dumping argument is somewhat questionable. The idea of dumping is talked about in your textbook, but is basically if I have a bunch of leftover goods and I know that there's a market out there that I'm trying to gain access to, I might sell those goods for well below what they cost me to make them. So the example might be a cell phone. Let's say the cell phone costs $250 to produce. I got all these excess leftovers, and I don't want to flood my local market. So instead, I'm going to pick a country and say, you know what, we want access into this market, let's say Denmark. And we haven't been able to get a foothold, so I'm going to take my $250 cell phone that it costs me to produce, not the, the price point, and sell it to the, De the Danish for... Uh, $50 each. And so there might be some, well, we need to protect against dumping in that regards. Could be protection of domestic jobs, um, somewhat argumentative, because in the search to protect domestic jobs, oftentimes domestic jobs are lost in other industries. And incorrect argument would be wage protection argument. And economists would say that wage protection or wage uh, differences are part of a country's comparative advantage. So if a country can hire workers in a factory to do a somewhat menial or unskilled job, then they should be allowed to uh, pay those wages.
and take advantage of their comparative advantage for the moment, which is cheap labor. Now we're going to transition into diagramming both free trade and protectionist policies. So first off, we start off with what does free trade look like in terms of when will a country export or import goods and how can we determine that? And then how do various protectionist policies affect those diagrams? So in this diagram, we have the supply that's domestic. So let's say this is the, uh, the American economy. So here's the supply of corn. Here's the demand for corn domestically. And let's say that the world price is fixed. So the idea is that there's so many producers of corn that it's relatively, it's perfectly elastic at a certain price. Now in the domestic market, we will consume this much at this price, but with a lowered world price than domestic price, what we end up with is the quantity demanded being Q2, which is not provided by our domestic supply curve. So what we have to do is at this price, here's the quantity demanded Q2, here's the domestic quantity supplied Q1. So the difference between these two, Q1 and Q2, is how much we'd have to import in America based on a world price below equilibrium. So anytime a pr the world price is below equilibrium, the country is going to be forced to import goods to cover the domestic demand. If we now take a look at the new supply in the world, if the supply of world is greater than the equilibrium price, then the country is going to export. So the price of the world is here, perfectly elastic, and so the domestic demand at this price is only this much. So that means the domestic demand is going to get covered, but we have this much corn to sell. So what we're going to do is we're going to export the excess corn, which is the difference between this quantity and this quantity. So the difference there when the world price is above equilibrium in the domestic market is that's going to be the value of the exports. The most important thing about these graphs to understand is that these graphs are all efficient, meaning that there's no dead weight loss created and the market outcome of whatever the world supply is, whether we have to import, export, or neither, is the efficient outcome. And any deviation away from those outcomes is going to create dead weight loss and be less efficient. Now if we take a look at the effect of a subsidy. So let's say the government is going to subsidize in order for uh, their industries to be more competitive from, uh, from foreign producers. So we have the supply of world being below, so we're going to import. And in order to lessen the imports and allow for more domestic production, the government's going to subsidize production, thus increasing the domestic supply and making the gap lesser between how much we're going to have to import. So the quantity supplied by the local or domestic producers are going to increase while the number of imports are going to decrease, thus making it better for domestic producers. Now our tariff graph is just simply going to raise the world price. So we have our, you know, kind of original graph if we just include this world price of imports. So the country would originally have to import the difference between Q1 and Q2. A tariff is simply a tax on the world, not on the domestic producer, because they're in the country already, so there's no, there's no tax placed on non-imported goods, because tariffs are a tax on imported goods. So as the world price rises, what we end up with is a smaller amount of imports. Now, consumers are going to decrease their consumption from Q2 to Q4 because of the higher price, higher price, less quantity demanded. But the number of imports are going to decrease, which lessens our reliance on foreign products, as well as our domestic production has increased from Q1 to Q3. Now, the government benefits from this through the tax revenue generated from the tariff, which is... We start with the quantity between 3 and 4 because this is how much we've you know, imported times you know, how much is actually or where the, the, the tariff is. So our tariff revenue ends up being that kind of rectangle there. This situation also makes society worse off in these two triangles here and here on either side because those are the welfare loss triangles welfare loss. Um, as society is worse off when we move away from free trade. <clears throat> so take a look at this blank graph and see if you can identify the parts 
of the graph, including the tariff revenue and the welfare loss areas. Another form of trade restriction is a quota. A quota is very simply putting a limit on the number of imported products. So back in our history in the 80s, I believe, there was a car quota put on foreign producers of cars to try to help out Detroit and, and the American auto manufacturing industry and industries. And so a quota was placed on imported products from especially Japan. So Toyota, Nissan, Honda cars were, were limited in how much they could um, be brought in. So while the world supply and world price is still below equilibrium, meaning that America is going to import our cars, the difference between Q1 and Q2, what a quota is going to do is disregard the world price and create a greater supply of goods that are available to the American e economy. So the idea is like here's the supply domestic plus the quota. So we're going to have a new equilibrium price. So we're going to put that as Q3. Here's the price of the quota. And then at this supply curve gives us our fourth quantity. And this difference would be the imports with the quota. So imports with quota. So the imports have fallen, as you can see, because Q1 and Q2 is a pretty good, good gap, and Q3 and Q4 gap is much smaller. So it's decreased the amount of imports necessary. Uh, to fulfill domestic demand at the given price, which in this case is the price of the quota. So of those imported goods, the revenue on the quota that the quota is going to generate is here. So here's the quota revenue box. And that's included in the welfare loss. So if I kind of outline the entire welfare loss, kind of trapezoid here. This blue tra trapezoid is the welfare loss from the quota. Remember that free trade is efficient and any deviation from free trade is less efficient. So there is the welfare loss in that sense. And here's a little bit cleaner look to the graph. So here's a graph that's already drawn for you with this U.S. supply plus the quota. And you can see its impact on the market and then here's our little welfare loss trapezoid right kind of in the middle here. So we lump all of these together and uh, for the sake of this video we're going to lump all of the trade barriers together, the tariffs and the, uh, <clears throat> the quotas especially, is we kind of lump those together and see what the effects of them are but they should always be talked about separately. For the government for the most part you're probably looking at creating revenue and kind of political clout with your population because you're helping somebody out who's domestic who is more than likely going to be able to vote for you whereas it's harming the foreign competitors and foreign producers are harmed through trade protection as their products now are less likely to sell whether it's a higher price or a lower number that they're able to sell in the US market or in whatever the domestic market is in the foreign consumers if we assume no retaliatory uh, tariff or quota, then the foreign consumers are going to remain relatively unaffected. Um, but if we assume that there's a retaliatory uh, tariff or quota, then that probably will affect the foreign consumers. But So I'm just going to assume no um, retaliation in trade barriers, so we're just going to kind of leave that. Domestic producers are much happier because they're going to be able to sell more products in either case and be more competitive. Domestic consumers are going to be less happy because they're, for the most part, paying a higher price and getting a less of a quantity uh, to choose from, less competition. So in these two senses, while we didn't do it, we could have calculated and shown the consumer and producer surpluses and how they change. And if you remember the basics of how to find consumer and producer surpluses, they act the same even though now we have this weird world price idea and especially world price price plus the tariff or the uh, the quota addition but the areas are going to be the same where is the area on the graph below the demand curve above the price that the consumers pay stopping at the quantity that they actually get to consume
And for producer surplus, it's the area above the supply curve and below the price they receive at whatever quantity um, that the domestic supply is going to be. And then an overall competition is lower as the foreign producers are um, regulated. So overall competition decreases, making the market less efficient and creating welfare loss. So that's one of the other effects So on society. I mean, welfare loss is definitely going to be a big piece of that chunk of you know, trade barriers being um, less efficient, thus creating welfare loss.